with all the departments that are here and all the HOBs and the section here that are here to support this launch for the speakers of the ICT department. With me, I have a my, my colleague David Wilson who is going to present the whole thing on how to use speakers and how speakers are important in the classroom. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David and I come from a company called Participate. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Yes. Um, and I think today, what's quite exciting in terms of you guys having these, what we refer to as QT devices or commonly known as clickers. And I think my goal today really is going to be to not only kind of give you a foundation for where and how this technology can be used, but teach you some of the basics. I see we are in camera. And so it'll be nice that this can be distributed elsewhere. What I'm going to do then, I think, understanding that there's still this is a lot of information gathering, I do want to leave you with some practical knowledge on how to use the system. Um, just in terms of who we are, I'm actually going to skip that, but Turning Technologies are the world's biggest supplier of clickers worldwide. They've got a uh, presence in over 100 countries. More than talking around the rest of the world, let's talk about South Africa. South Africa, locally here, we have about 50,000 devices in circulation across all our different customers. We've got about 500 customers in the university space. Our two biggest customers are probably the University of Pretoria, followed by Chwani University of Technology. Uh, we have about 14 universities on our books. And um, we're quite proud in terms of being South Africa that we are in the top 10 partners worldwide for turning technologies, um, which is quite nice little pat on our own back. Um, in terms of the different products that are available, so many of you would have started, for those of you who already use clickers, probably use this one over here. That's our most popular selling device. There's 20 million of them in circulation around the world. Really, really stable, well-designed device. But very exciting that you guys have got what we refer to as a QT2, this black keypad over here. Most of you I see have got one out. This one here, the only thing that I don't like about it is it looks like a Blackberry and I'm an Apple fan but that's my personal uh, preference. Um, very well engineered device, comfortable to hold. The primary difference between this one here and the other ones that you would have used, so let me just open it up here. And I apologize to the cameraman because I like to walk around, so I'll keep you awake. Um, so this one here and this one, the primary difference being it has a full keyboard, so I'm allowed now to submit a text response, so you can op ask an open-ended question. This one here is multiple choice only, designed nicely, they don't break easily. Um, yeah, with over 50,000 have been sold, I think we've had less than 20 returned over the last 10 years. This one here I'm not going to drop because Patricia at the office will beat me up for doing that. It is a bit more sensitive, it has a bit more built into it. Also because it has the keyboard we can now submit what we refer to or you can partake in what we call self-paced polling. Okay, So you have the ability to create a test, you can distribute that test be it on paper then what happens, each student can go through that test at their own pace by submitting answers on this device going forward and backwards. As the instructor, you have a dashboard that shows the responses coming in, so you're able to monitor your students in real time. So you could say set an hour for a particular test, hand out those papers. You can also have multiple versions. So I can version one, version two, version three. So it prevents cheating in amongst the students and they can then complete their test using this and you can submit calculations. I'm not going to have time today. They're not allowed in by the looks of it. Welcome. Um, so you can submit calculations so you can actually have line by line submission with this device. Unfortunately today I won't have enough time to get into all of that detail. Um, because that will take probably another hour on top of the training time that we have. So those are two devices. Also with this device you are able to submit questions or a student can submit questions throughout class. They can type in a question and submit it. You can actually view that off screen and actually publish or respond to that question in real time. So it kind of gives a voice to the voiceless. Also as you can see we've got a a phone, a smartphone, a tablet and a computer. 
Turning Technologies offers a complete holistic solution for clickers. So in fact, you can use any device that opens up a browser. We have apps in the app stores, the Google Play Store, and the iOS Store. And so when the campus gets to the stage where they'd like to consider using mobile devices, we actually have an inclusive option for that. However, that's also another conversation. And if we have time, I'm very happy to talk in terms of the practicalities of looking at mobile devices in classrooms. We also have different tools for lecturers. So I'm using the presenter card. You have one of those over there. This, as you can see, allows me to walk around and control my presentation just like a regular pointer like mouse. Um, the difference is it does have some key functionality built into it for the clickers. We also have an app which replicates the same functionality. If you search, search PresenterWare or search Turning Technologies in the App Store, if you have a Samsung phone or an iPhone that has that app, and a nice thing is that it then controls your, your presentation as well. You're able to even create content from your phone and it'll create, so for example, I could ask a question by typing it on my phone. I hit submit, it pushes that question from my phone to a new slide in PowerPoint and we then have that question available for all your students in class. Then very important, we have the receiver. Okay, that's this little chap. I actually had one out, or plugged one out. Please don't lose this. This is your most expensive part of the system. It's the receiver. It's able to handle up to a thousand responses in a second. So you can have a thousand students submitting a response and this little device captures all that information. Next onto the software. Okay, so the screenshots, and this is probably something we can discuss a bit after the training with the right people. So subsequent to you guys purchasing uh, your system, Turning globally has gone to a different software model. So for the last 10 plus years, they've been providing clicker software for free. They spend $2 million every year on research and development. It's the most expensive product that they've never charged for. They have now followed the likes of Microsoft and you know a lot of Apple products as well where they've now put an annual subscription in place. Um, it's not a massive subscription. I will chat to the right people perhaps we can chat afterwards because I would like to see if I can motivate a free 12 months license for you with your system. Just so you guys don't have to worry about it and then you can, we can pick up the conversation at a later stage. It was a decision that Turning Technologies made globally. Unfortunately, they didn't consult all the international partners and so we've been uh, kind of debating with them over the last six months on the right approach to this. And I, I personally don't have a massive problem with it because I do think it's fair that they spend so much money in research and development and the fee is not a large fee and their software is the best on the market. So like all the other vendors that charge for their software, they're now recovering a bit of a cost. But essentially, so the screenshots we have here are for, the, for what we call turning point eight. You guys are running on turning point five like most of our customers. Turning point five, um, it's, it will work with Office 2010 and uh, Windows uh, either 10 or Windows 7. We have had it working on, on Office 2013, but it's not as stable. Um, so we've had one or two issues, and so that's why we do recommend the upgrade. Um, but so just the screenshots that you see today are slightly different colors, but the product itself is very much the same. The functionality is very much the same. There's one or two new features in this software um, which are very exciting. Um, which once you upgrade you can use those. We have things like word, word, word clouds. So text can be submitted from students and it builds a cloud on the screen with the most popular items. But essentially we have the three different types of polling. PowerPoint polling being our most popular. Most of our lecturers are teaching with PowerPoint and so they use that as the integration. Then we have Anywhere Polling, which is the middle selection. That is a floating toolbar that allows you to vote over any other software application. So perhaps you're doing some Java, you're, you know, maybe you're doing some coding, and you've got that on the screen. Turning Point Anywhere basically pops up in front of that. You're able to ask a question and then hides away. And so you can bring that up whenever you want it. And the last one, which I just mentioned, is the self-paced polling as well. But anyway, let's go into some of the details. So what we normally do, particularly for your first classes, is that you introduce the clicker, tell them how it works. Okay, so first of all, these devices, if you've all got one in front of you, just press a number for me. 
on screen my one's battery is dead so i'm gonna oh no this one here this is one of yours it's oh no it's not dead you might have one of these at the back if you got a little paper pull the paper out you should be able to just pull it out and then it'll turn the device on okay so if you look at the screen here we go I'll just grab another one so let me quickly just take you through the device itself gosh and this one doesn't want to come out there we go so the first time you see it if you press any of the keys in the top left hand corner it'll say 41 okay so I, I'm going to kind of dip you in the deep end for a bit and then we'll come back out to the shallow end and carry on with the turning so that is the channel of the device the reason why we have different channels it runs on a radio frequency what you might find is this classroom is running on channel 41 next door is also running on channel 41 so what happens if I'm answering questions here I may be answering questions in the next door okay so that's why we would change the channel and I will get into the details of changing the channel at a later stage but essentially there's no on off button okay so you don't need to turn the device on it's automatically on as soon as you press a key when you leave it it basically goes into what we refer to as a deep sleep mode and so it conserves battery life it is backlit as well I mean in a well that like this an environment like this you don't necessarily notice it but in a dark environment that screen is lit and you're able to control that as well by pressing you've got the little wrench button to the right of the arrow keys and then there you can you've got the you can use the arrows to navigate and do the different things so for instance you'll see there there's a little hand up you can actually send a message by using that and if I click high and go OK so I've just typed in a message if I bring up my show bar I just want to quickly show you something So, so this over here is my little show bar and it can tell me over here if I click on that so this we what what ideally you want to do is run this in a extended desktop so you can see that is how a student can communicate with me during the class okay what you're going to have to do is slowly introduce the students to this technology okay so I wouldn't start right at the end and say these are all the amazing things you can do we start by saying we're going to use this to respond to questions don't mention the fact that they can submit messages because you're going to get all sorts of cheeky messages off the bat okay so as as you get into your classroom you start with the basics and then build on that from there but anyway so as you can see it's quite a nice thing and then I have the ability to type a message and send it back either to a particular student or the entire class as well so I'm going to close that for now Oops. What else I could do just do is uh... so after a little rabbit trail there. Um, what we normally do is explain the clicker to the class. Okay. So at the moment, you guys will get to play with this essentially to answer multiple choice questions. You've got buttons one through ten on the side. 10 obviously only has a zero because I don't have enough space to put one and a zero you've got your keypad and you that excuse me can type your responses so let's go to a really taxing first question I've only given two options and I'd like to know if you are a female or a male one or two just to explain so on screen here this is what we refer to as the show bar the green light indicates that voting is open or polling is open so far I've got three responses from you and you can either press basically one or two in the top left hand side okay so just press one or two and you'll see if you press you'll get a reflection of the number and it'll have a little check mark next to it for those on camera can you see so I'm pressing number two let's have a look have you got yours so, so just press the back button okay I press back again Okay, now, now I submit a response. So it must be always at a yeah. Okay, and that, that, that's just how that is. So, so when you're using this particular device, one thing you want to make sure, if the students have been playing with it and they're in all the submenus, they need to press the back key. So there's a little arrow that goes back to take them out to kind of 
the base level so they can respond. Because if you're busy typing a message to me, you're not going to be able to answer the question until you finish typing the message or escape from typing that message. Okay, so we've got 12 responses. And these are the worst kind of audiences when there's more boys than girls. That's just my opinion. <laughs> okay, so just to explain what's just happened. I've asked a question in terms of educational process. What normally happens now, if I ask a question verbally, I hear crickets. Or I just hear from the loudmouth in the front who's very happy to have a big conversation and tell everybody what he thinks or she thinks. Okay? If I, this is educational content, I'm delivering a, a message. I am now forcing you to think on the spot, so actually cognitively process what I've just delivered in terms of content and give me a response. From a student's perspective, I am being stimulated because I'm playing with a device, so I'm not falling asleep. I'm anticipating getting asked questions. I give my answer, which means I have thought about what you have said and I've now chosen my answer. I also get to compare my answer with my colleagues, with my peers. Okay? So all of that leads to an increase of retention of material. The statistics say a 50% increase in retention. You can Google uh, clicker case studies. There is a wealth of papers that has been published on, the, on various elements of clicker technology. Uh, clicker technology, particularly our system, supports currently 12 different learning theories okay, that we have identified by the different features in our devices. But just the simple mechanics from a student's perspective, I'm not, I'm not raising my hand and being concerned about being embarrassed or humiliated by my mates. I am simply keying in my response and it also gives a voice to every single introvert in the audience as well. So not, you're not going to hear just from those who've got the big mouths, you now can hear from everybody. As an instructor, I get to see immediately the lay of the land. So it's like that dipstick that you mentioned. You want to know exactly what guys, you know, what's the temperature in the room? Do they understand? Don't they understand? Do I need to reteach a topic? Because normally what would happen, I'd have to write a test. I'd have to mark that test and only then would I identify the gaps. And during that whole process, I lose time. So now with a tool like this, I'm able to do it immediately. Okay, how long have you been teaching for? I'm not asking for your age, just how long you've been in education. So less than three years, and this should now list one, two, three, four, but we've got an A, B, C, D, E, so one, two, three, four, five. And you do notice how quiet my class is while I'm asking questions. You will find exactly the same when you're actually teaching live. Okay? Gosh. So I would probably fit in this, but I don't teach formally, I teach informally. So a lot of experience, which is wonderful because we can learn a lot. Right, and then just for fun, it looks like the males are just slightly ahead on the experience. So what I've done here without telling you is that I actually used what we refer to as a demographic question, okay? So I told the computer to be able, I wanted to analyze responses independently. I wanted to be able to look at the male responses and the female responses. Okay, and so think about how you can apply that in a classroom. So you might have English students and Kosovo students and Zulu students and Afrikaans students. And you could actually ask them a question. So what is your home language? And then you can ask questions and you can then see how the different students who speak different mother tongues respond to those questions. So whether they're understanding the content or is it because they don't understand the question and the language that's been spoken. So just a random example. Like, so you are able to dissect response data at a whole nother level which can make you more effective in your instruction. Yeah. So where, when do you generate this? Is it instant like, let's say you get the answers. Go back, just, just. Let's say you get that. Then you want to make it more interesting. Now you want to look at the, you said demographic. Yes. When do you generate them? Like, is it at that particular time or you already preset them? Okay, so, so for the benefit of the camera, I'm going to repeat the questions so that you're recording it. So the question is, when do we set that up? Do we set that up ahead of time or do we set that up before? Okay, the answer is both. 
which is doesn't make sense the answer is either ahead of time or during the presentation okay and by the way I'd like you to please ask questions if, if you have a burning issue don't wait for me to ask if there's any questions please just interrupt me um, particularly if you think it's a useful question that everybody can benefit from like this is a good question so ideally you'll come in with a plan but the clickers allows you the freedom to respond to data coming in in real time so if I wanted to assess that I can literally press escape and just insert a demographic comparison slide okay it's very simple to do I can also create content from the show bar so if I go here I can go and insert a question and I've got I can insert either pre-populated or I can make a custom question and say you know do you think this is cool question mark So I've just typed in a question and as quick as that, I can then actually get another layer of information. Okay. Should I open that? If I just put my hand there, does it open? No touch. Check it out. Clicker training. Yes. Come in. How are you? Good, thank you. How's it? So then you can answer that question and you can get a real-time response. So it depends on your teaching style, your objectives with that particular lesson and what you're trying to achieve. So in revision, perhaps you want to allow for more questions if you're in a revision class. So you allow a lot more freedom. If you are perhaps delivering content on a particular subject for the first time maybe less questions in the beginning because you want to get through the material and then have questions at the end but the idea for this system there's a there's a theory that talks around just-in-time teaching um, Dr. Derek Bruff agile teaching there's another terminology for it so he talks about how almost the content in his classes are created by the class themselves asking questions and so he teaches by responding to questions that they have but it also requires students that have done pre-reading so in the event that students haven't actually read the textbook that teaching might not work off the bat so you'll look at the different audiences and then what's going to make sense and then just for fun, this is a super old question I should have changed it but do you think dear old Oscar Pistorius got a fair trial? And don't worry, we're not publishing this anyway. So that's A for strongly disagree, B disagree, C agree, or D strongly agree. Okay, I'm happy with that. Just like so again, now what we can do is go compare. Interesting here. So I often just look at it a male female to see the interpretation of the case. And so here you can see, for those that responded, we've got 50-50 split that said disagree for male and female. We had one male that said disagree. We had uh, dominant female saying agree here and less males. So you can also use it to create debate in class, depending on what you're teaching and the, like whether it's a theory or if it's, you know, if it's just simple content that they need to learn. You can have a lot of fun because now you're going to get them to engage with the content at a different level. You have the ability to create quizzes in class. Okay, this has got nothing to do with the subject areas that any of you teach, but it's history. Mr. Jan van Riebeck arrived in Cape Town on the 6th of April. Was it 1632, 1642, 1652, or 1662? And you've got 10 seconds to answer. So the creation of games in class. So now we've element, added an element of fun by having a countdown. We can do speed scoring. You can then have a class prize. You can create teams. And the correct answer is, in fact, C. Oops, sorry. I've lost my animation. But the correct answer is C in green. So that's just an example of what, what you can do, a very bad one, if that. What I'd like to know from you in terms of your primary objective, so I know we spoke about it quickly, but if you had to select here, and in fact, sorry, I've just upgraded this presentation. Before you answer that, I just want to quickly change something on it. 
So I'm going to ask you to re-answer that as soon as I get the results. Answers, question options. Multiple responses. So what I just did there was I changed the number of answers you're allowed to select. So here you can select multiple answers. So I would say in order of importance, what would be your key objectives for this uh, particular training session? And using clickers going forward. Let me stand out the way. Can you all see that? So now you see how I'm allowing you to select multiple options. See that I am testing your ability to convert from numeric to uh, the alphabet. <laughs> Apologize for that. Somebody at the door again. It's open. <laughs> you have to buy us all coffee now, huh? Okay, I'll give you a fascinating statistic here is that every time we ask this question, D always wins. It's the number one desire across culture, across universities, across the world for lecturers to want to have a participative or culture of participation in the classroom. And then in terms of what we would like to do today, what would you like to have as your take home? What's most important from this list for you? Because that will then direct my attention in terms of the training that we do now. Let me move up the way again, sorry. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds. Yes, ma'am. For attendance. So the answer is yes. It's a bit complicated. So the question for the, for the video was, can this be used for attendance in class? The answer is yes, it can. In a perfect world, one per student, because they arrive and you've already got that information ahead of time. So what would have to happen in terms of attendance, you would have to have a class list perhaps published either in the beginning of the semester or at the beginning of class on the screen. And I'm David and I know that I'm looking on the screen and I'm device 123. So I go and I pick up device 123 and I sit down. 
So that would be the way. Otherwise, you can simply ask a question and say, please type in your name. And then they click and they type in their name. And then you'll have a, in your Excel spreadsheet, you'll have a list of names of those who typed in their names. Did I answer the question? Not really. Yes. Somehow, put it on the slide, then do we do the same thing that we're doing now? Just click on the number like this, the business number 22, and then you need to come to 2 and say, OK, and then it's an So, so y yes. So, the, again, the question's around, um, around taking attendance in class and putting up lists. So there's a, let me maybe explain. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. So first of all, the system can actually accept uh, class lists. So you can preload a class list for every single class that you do. When you teach that particular class, all that you do then is load that particular list that's relevant for that time. Because we don't have one device per student, you might have that every, class, every time that I'm doing Web Design 101, I know that I'm device number one. So I just know when I come into class, because the first time I'll read it, the second time I come to class, I remember that I must pick up device number 101. Or what happens, you just publish on the screen. So you just show them whether it's, it's the Excel list or if it's the turning point class list, the, the information's the same. So I would just choose whatever looks better on the screen, and the student then picks up the right device. Otherwise, we have something called real-time registration, and this may work better. So real-time registration, all that you do is you load the names of all the students okay, ahead of time. Then what happens when they come into class, they pick up a device. Then you use the real-time registration tool, and I will show you during the training what it looks like. Basically, it will publish them the list of names, and they must just key in the number that's next to their name to then attach that device to their name. So that was turning solution because when you're teaching a big class, it's a disaster to try to get 200 students through the door and to pick up the right device. So the, their solution was the real-time registration where you load the list of names, you then hand out the devices at random, and you just spend two minutes in the beginning attaching the right device to the right name. Okay. But I, I give you an example. So a campus like the University of Pretoria, they went for what they call the bookstore model, the student purchase model. So it's the student's responsibility to buy their own clicker. So we supply clickers to the bookstores. And when they go pick up their textbook, they buy their clicker as well. They wrote it as a requirement for their classes. And now I think we're just under 8,000 clickers on campus there. They've seen a 20% increase in natural sciences marks by using clickers teaching there. So it's had a great, great response. Um, there was a little bit of resistance from the students in the beginning because of the cost of purchasing a clicker. Um, but then we were motivated by saying, first of all, you can resell it after you're done with it. You can actually give it back to the bookstore. Some of the bookstores would purchase back. And also, if you're the, the lectures were using it for first, second, and third year. So you're buying a device that you're able to use for more than one year, and also multiple classes. So once the students understood that, there was very little resistance to buying the clicker. So did I answer your question at the back there? Is that all right? Okay. Let's have a look. Okay, saving and generating reports. Okay, so we'll spend some time there. Inserting additional fee crediting and best practices. I'd like to, if we have enough time, I'll try to get to some uh, best practices because we've got a, I've got a whole thing that we talk about, you know, some of the actual learning theories alongside a turning point. We can do some illustrations of how that works. Right, so let's start. I'm assuming that you all have this installed. Has everybody got a laptop or computer with it installed? Because at this time, what I'd like you to do is open up Turning Point.
Okay, so has everybody got a computer that's either booting up or almost there or somewhere in that direction? Yeah. Do these devices have a unique ID? Yes. So if the student loses his and wants to up. You can track that. Yeah. We have exactly that. So like University of Pretoria, we have 8,000 of these devices and sometimes they do get stolen. But the guys are like, as soon as it pops up on the system, it's like, well, he reported it's stolen. And bye-bye, you leave the campus because that's theft. Okay, so I see most of you got the... So I, I apologize, some of the logos are in fact... What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up an old version of this presentation. Give me a second. Okay, there we go. So that's the previous version of software. So once you open up, so you can double click on that icon that looks like turning point. Let me go back there. So that's it over there. And you, once you've double clicked on that, if it's installed, you'll be faced with a slide that looks like that. Okay, so that we call the turning point dashboard. And I mentioned just now in the presentation, we have PowerPoint polling, anywhere polling, and self-paced polling. For the purpose of today, we're going to focus on just the PowerPoint polling elements. So you can click on that for now. And what I'm going to do is that you'll see that that opens up your PowerPoint presentation. So yeah, just click on that. Just get a couple of it. PCs just boots it up and might just be. <laughs> have, you, have you got a mouse for this one? Is there a mouse there? Let's just, let me just come aside and drive for a sec. Uh, let's just go. It's task manager. Ah, you're not running in as administrator. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it's just Biggie Star. Okay. Yeah. Thinks it's Monday. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video so you don't have to listen to me all day. But in this video, we're going to um, go through everything you need to do. See if I can. Then bear in your presentations, first launch the turning point software. Once the dashboard opens, you will next select where it Okay, so I'm going to start that from the beginning again. Okay, so this chap, is, his name is Kevin, who's on the video, or his voice. Uh, he is the international client success manager now. He was previously the head of training. What we'll do is we're going to play this video. This video talks about what needs to happen before class. Okay, and we're going to create one or two slides together. Welcome to the PowerPoint Polling New Users Tutorial. To begin building your presentation, first launch the Turning Point software. Once the dashboard opens, you will next select where it reads PowerPoint Polling. Once PowerPoint Polling opens, it will automatically open up a blank PowerPoint presentation. If you do not have an existing PowerPoint to integrate the polling slide within, you may build from scratch at this time. If you have an existing PowerPoint, you will now go ahead and open up that presentation. You will now notice how you have the integration with the Turning Point software. Polling slide, you will select the new button in the upper left-hand corner. 
From the drop down is where all the question types are located. For this tutorial's purpose, we will select multiple choice. Once the slide inserts into your presentation, you have just three remaining steps. The first step is to type in your question. The second step is to now type in up to 10 answer choices. And your third and your final step is the click outside the segmented answer box. You may set a correct answer for a question by selecting scoring options within the slide preferences on the right hand side of your screen. Once the scoring option menu expands, select the drop down that corresponds with the correct answer and select correct. This will automatically make all of your other answer choices incorrect. Once you have built your entire presentation, you are now ready to save it. You will save your presentation in the same manner that you save any PowerPoints. So for our purposes, I'm going to File, Save As, Save as a PowerPoint Presentation. This now concludes the PowerPoint poll tutorial. We'll do that together quickly now. So I will follow, you can follow me on screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new slide or new presentation. Okay, so the first thing is on the turning point menu. Mine will look slightly different in terms of colors, but all the positions are the same. On the far left hand side, I click on new. And I select the first option, multiple choice. Okay? Once I've done that, it's now created a slide for me. I type in my question. Click outside that box, type in my answer options. Click outside the answer box, and I'm done. Last click to click outside the box. Okay. So first thing we go on the turning point menu, new, multiple choice. Yeah, there. So start there. Yeah, you just click outside and that's a job. We'll, we'll, we'll save the presentation, we'll go through, but that's perfect. And the great news is I get to go home now because I can see you've all done it. So my job is done. Thank you very much. It's been nice knowing you all. And I will see you next time. No, I'm checking. So, but the point I'm making is it is that simple. Okay. So everything we do from here on is optional. But you now have all created your first interactive clicker question in PowerPoint. Okay? You follow those steps. First step was on the turning point menu, click on, insert a question on the left hand side. We selected multiple choice. The next step was type in your answer or question, click outside that box, type in your answer options, click outside that box, and you've now created a question. Okay. So that is the fundamental basics of creating clicker content. Now what you're going to do is that on the right hand side you should have a second menu, a settings menu. It looks slightly different from mine. But the point being is that you'll have a bunch of options. Should I close that door? So first of all, this particular question has a correct answer. When I last checked my diary, today is Tuesday. So we're going to make Tuesday the correct answer. I do that by on the right hand side, so you'll see Tuesday's option B. I go to option B here, and I set it as correct. Okay? Once you've done that, you'll see on yours, your, your, your bar should also change color. Okay? But right now, at this time, I know the correct answer and I've told the computer the correct answer, but I'd like to indicate to my class what the correct answer is. And I can do that in one of three ways. The first way is I can tell them, hey class, well done, the correct answer is Tuesday and that's option B. 
but if I'm going to print a report and I want to check how many students got the answer wrong or right, I need to also tell the computer that the, which is the right answer. We have done that, but to show the class, in class there's another two ways to do it. The first way is to insert what we refer to as a correct answer indicator, which is an object, or we can change the colors of the graph. Now the standard is red and green for correct and incorrect. <laughs> I shouldn't say it, but my personal challenge there is that what happens if you have a colorblind student? Red and green is not always the first things that they can see, so therefore make sure you use the correct answer indicator. Okay, so to insert a correct answer indicator, we go to the second menu item from the left hand side where it says objects. I click on objects and the first option is correct answer indicator and I'm just going to select a check mark. Okay, I'm just going to walk around and see how you're all doing. Okay, so on the second objects, click on objects above there, no, 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 there we go. The correct answer indicator, first menu item and you choose your object. Okay, there are a couple of random ones that you can choose from. All down there, you've got one there, go on there, yes. Okay, so on your objects menu, select correct answer indicator, first, first menu item, and then select one of your choice. I use the check mark. Okay, so what, what's, what's happening here is that we haven't told the computer what the right answer is yet. So we need to do that first. So on, the, on your right-hand menu, can I just drive for a second? Okay. So I click outside there. So what happens here? Scoring options. Oh. If I have made that the correct answer, I set that to correct. Now I can go objects. Oh. Okay. okay. So yep. same for you. So you'd go, so just scroll down. Scoring options, so make A correct or B correct, it doesn't matter. No, no, just, just, no, just set one is correct. And then default, everything else then correct. Now you can go object. And then choose, yeah, whichever one. See. Okay. I'd just like to highlight something to you quickly uh, in terms of, it's a mistake that I have made on a few occasions. So if I create a question, then I'm just going to quickly do the same question again. So follow the steps, insert question, multiple choice, what day is today? And we go mo Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Click outside the box. Now I want to insert my correct answer. What should happen here? If I go objects, Correct answer, smiley face, nothing's happening. Can anybody tell me why? Because I haven't told the computer where to put that correct answer indicator. So always you've got to first tell it what's right. So I've got to click on the... At the bottom there, make an answer correct first. Then I can go and insert my correct answer indicator. Okay, any questions that you have on that? So far, is everybody comfortable with that? We can all do that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so choose, just click on any of them, it's fine. Okay, so go to scoring options, click on scoring options. Set Tuesday as correct, so B as correct. and now follow the same process. So you need to tell the computer what the right answer is before we insert the animation. Okay. Um, thinking back to some of the examples that we were going to do, let me show you some of the practical elements of this. So on your chart, because some of you did indicate that you wanted to know how to make your slides pretty. I'll show you just some examples. So first of all, we can use your normal PowerPoint design template. So if I went to design on my menu, I can choose any of these designs, okay, 
and it's going to update my charts and color scheme with that. So just because we're using the clickers, it doesn't mean that we have to have a boring presentation. We can make it look quite nice, okay? And just when you do that, what happens if I click on this particular chart, you'll see that your menu changes, okay? So now I can change the colors of my chart. So right now it is set to PowerPoint scheme. I can choose define colors. If I do that, it'll update it to the colors that I choose from the below menu. Or I can go and choose correct and incorrect and the default there is red and green. Okay, so there's a, just a little bit of extra in terms of designing your, your slide. Okay, and you can also choose other types of graphs. Okay, so if we go back to the turning point menu at the top, <laughs> under objects, I can go the second item. The first one we did was correct answer indicator. The second one is charts. I can choose different types of charts. So if I wanted to use a horizontal chart, for instance, it changes the graphic. Okay. I can use an offset chart. The design of the chart often depends on how much content your question has. So the more detail you have in your question, the less space you're going to have to have the graphic. So in terms of design, this is the business of many of you who are instructional designers, you've got to figure out how to best position. In terms of technique, my advice is to keep your questions short, concise, and simple. They must not be ambiguous, okay? Often a good idea to test your content or questions with another lecturer. Because if you're like me, often you're doing work at the last minute, you're designing questions at half past 11 at night, you've got a class at 8 a.m. in the morning, what you're writing at half past 11 at night is probably not your best work, okay? So you want to be able to test questions. And what happens, you get into a class and you read the question for the first time and it's live and you're it's not a nice question. Okay, so just in terms of principle in a perfect world, it's always a good idea to test your content with other lecturers. Um, let me go back to my cheat sheet. So perhaps what I'll me do, I'm going to just quickly take you through some other question options. Okay, so under new, you've also got short answer. Okay. I click on short answer, I can then enter in a question that's going to expect a text response, okay? And then on the right hand menu, I have different options in terms of what I can change that. So, we can write expected correct answers here. So I could say, you know, when was TUT Funded. Does anybody know the answer to that? <laughs> huh? When was that? 19? 2000. So you can add those sort of answers in there. Okay. Most of this is quite self explanatory. I don't want to spend too much time unless there's questions that you have that you'd like me to answer. So I do want to respect your time and the fact that I also arrived late because um, I started heading towards the wrong campus. My diary gave me the wrong information. Okay. You've got, so short answers, numeric responses, true, false, demographic assignment slides. So that question I did earlier was I had a, a, a slide that basically assigned that profile to my audience. So it could be,
C2. It is right. I can't, I must actually put my glasses on. I can't read. <laughs> so you can keep typing whatever. That's wrong. That's right. I need my glasses on. But you get the, you get the point of where I'm going. So you can create question demographic profiles. You know what's sometimes interesting is, you know, where's your hometown? So is the student someone who's local to Sashanguva? Have they grown up here in the Pretoria surrounding area? Or have they come from the Northern Cape? And you can pick up how they respond to questions. Um, it could be, are you in my A group, B group, C group? So in terms of normal class marks, like how are my different groups responding to different types of questions? You can decide what you want to do. And then at the end of doing that, what you can do is that you can go under the um, tools button, you'll see that there is a comparative link. And that's what I did earlier. So what is your home language is my comparative slide and I want to look at how they answer what is today. Now what will happen is it will show me how they answer that. They confront those two spectrums, if it makes sense. Right. Um, other slides, Likert scale. So this is a standard question. So maybe there's opportunities where you want them to engage. You're going to ask for a student's or the student's opinion, leading opinion in the classroom. And this is a question that you then generate discussion from. So is blue and yellow a good combination when designing a PowerPoint presentation? Or I'm going to change that into a statement. Blue and yellow is a good color combination in designing a PowerPoint presentation. Do you agree with me or do you disagree with me? And you put that, that scale in place. Because now what happens, we can start to debate around that content. Why is it good? Why is it bad? So in terms of a teaching style and technique, a very, very powerful and very commonly used technique around the world in terms of teaching. Other things, and this is going into kind of best practices. So we're playing with the ideas of having questions that have a correct answer, have an incorrect answer. What about creating a question that does not have a correct answer and ask the students to answer the right answer? Then all of a sudden they'll debate, no, but ma'am, sir, there's no correct answer. But that's the point. You're getting them to engage with the content. It doesn't matter whether there is a correct or correct answer. You're getting them to think through it and say, well, actually, none of those is right. So cognitively, they're processing the right information and they're actually going to learn something. Because when it comes to a test, they'll remember the debate that they had in class around that particular content. Priority ranking. So you also have the ability to have a list of items. <coughs> Excuse me. Have a list of items and then prioritize them. So here's a list of 10 values. Select in your order of preference what you value the most. Is there any way I can get a glass of water? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's creating questions. And on those questions, you can insert different objects, okay? From correct answer indicators, which we've all done together, charts, countdowns as well, which you would have seen on the one slide that I had. And you can choose, often choose gemstone like that. And then just so you know, it is a PowerPoint object. So we can go here and I can change the format of it. So I can change the colors of it, depending on what I want to do. Shape full, I can make no full, make the text black. Whatever, whatever I want to do, I can change these objects by using that menu. Okay? And there are different types of... So you've got all different like basic animations as well. Other objects, you've got a grid. I would probably not use this. So this basically duplicates the little counter at the top in the show bar. So while you're doing that presentation, it shows you the results coming in or the responses. So that kind of duplicates that over there. 
the prompt is something that I've never used because I find it kind of obvious when you ask a question that it demands an answer. That's just putting an answer now kind of prompt on the screen. And then you've also got stats. So that may be useful for some of you. You to ask for the mean, median, standard variation, standard deviation or variance. You can also generate that information in the reports. Okay. Any other questions right now? So I'm going to give you a break because I can feel the energy just disappearing. My energy is also disappearing. So I'm going to give you a two minute break to quickly stand up. Yes, question. Sorry, I'm struggling to hear you say that again. Like, like a completed person, when did TT major take? Yes. Where you don't want multiple choice, you want them to see how they can, you know, give their own answers. It's not a true or false. Thing. Yeah. So, so that, yeah. so that's type typing in an answer. Yeah. So that that you just so I typed in that as an option. It's not going to display that on the screen. So I typed that as an expected response. Okay. So you can just have free text completely where they just type in anything. So maybe the question doesn't necessarily have a correct answer. You can also do that. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions? Before we have a quick leg stretch, we break, drink break, smoke break for those who want to have a cigarette. Okay, can we, do you want to do a two minute break? Are you happy with that? Do we need a two minute break? I can also keep going. I'm like an energizer bunny, I just don't stop. <laughs> Okay, so the time on my watch is 11.45. Can we kick off at 10 to 12? The thing is, <clears throat> during your presentation, so this is another video clip that I'm going to play. Can you all hear that, by the way? If you have not yet done so, Please take this opportunity to download the steps for running a PowerPoint Fold presentation. This 10-step document will be your guidepost for running the presentation in the classroom. If your students are using response cards, your first step will be to plug the receiver into the USB port. Step two is to launch the Turning Point software. Step number three is to verify the connection. Verify connection basically means be sure that the receiver channel is the same as the student's response card channels. If you are using responseware, now is the time where you would log in. Step number four is an optional step, which is to select your participant list. Step number five is to now select where it reads PowerPoint poll. Once PowerPoint opens, you are now ready for your next step, which is to open your presentation. Once your presentation opens, you are now ready for step number seven, which is to reset the session. Resetting the session will eliminate any previously saved information on the slide. Step number eight is to now run the presentation. Once in presentation mode and you land on a turning point slide, polling will open up automatically. In the upper right hand corner, just to the left of pulling open, we can now see how many of our students have answered in real time. Once we can view that all of our students have responded, one advance on your slide will now close the polling and display your results. Once you are done with your entire presentation, you are now ready for step number nine, which is to save the session. Saving the session is an optional step. You will only need to save the session if you plan on generating the reports at a later time. To save the session, click on the Save button on the Turning Point toolbar, and then select Save Session. Name your session, and then click Save again. This now concludes the PowerPoint poll tutorial.
Yes. Say that again. Any Windows system, any version of Mac as well. So it operates on both. So the question for the camera was what operating systems? And it's both Windows and Mac. Uh, both, it's Windows 7, Windows 10, uh, Microsoft Office 10, 13, OpenOffice as well. And then Mac, I forget the name, like Mountain Lion and all the different names, whatever the latest it is working on that. Okay, so these 10 points, in, in your guides here, you will have a CD that would have been, uh, might be in the office, but there's a CD that has all this information on as well, so we will, and I'll also send you an updated version. But if, yes sir? Let's say you have, let's say software engineering, you find that when you buy a book, they have presentation slides, and then uh, do you, do you convert them, take everything to this and use this? Absolutely. So the question is, if you buy, I guess, a textbook that comes with content already, can you use that with this? The answer is, some of it is already in a clicker format. So depending on which textbook or which publisher, um, some of them come with clicker content. Otherwise, they might have PowerPoint presentations or a text document. You can take that and convert it into clicker content quite easily. That answer the question. Okay, so we, we can show, perhaps I can also do one-on-one, -on -one. I can just show you, because literally, because you're creating a PowerPoint presentation, so you can copy information from Word documents into it, you can copy information from Excel, copy from text documents, so you, I, you don't have to retype, just copy and paste, and build, build that content. Yeah, so also if you have a presentation, so if you've been supplied a PowerPoint, all you're going to do is create a new slide inside of that PowerPoint presentation. You must remember that this, I'm showing you a PowerPoint presentation. I don't have to create, every time I want questions, to create a new presentation just for questions. I use one and the same. I can have my questions interspersed amongst my teaching slides. And that's the idea. So you'll teach a little bit, have a question. Teach a little bit more, have another question. So you don't have to have two separate presentations, one for your lesson and one for your questions. It's one and the same thing. Correct. You, you, just, you just open up, the thing is you'd have to open up turning point, so double click, and that opens up PowerPoint, then navigates and open up that presentation that you've been supplied from whichever textbook publisher it is. I'm very happy to show you that afterwards as well, we can go through it. These 10 steps, if you follow these 10 steps, you will never ever have a system failure unless the computer explodes. It's very, very unlikely that you'll experience failure. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to do that all together. Um, there was another laptop here somewhere. Where is it? Have you? There it is there. Can I use this one as an example? So right, who would like to be the guinea pig? Everybody jumps up at the same time, eh? But we'd like you all to come and stand around here as well because it's best to learn like that. Your receiver that you had. Okay. So who's going to stand up? Who is experienced? No, I want someone who's not experienced. <laughs> okay. So, and you can all come and join here as well. This is an interactive training. Right, let's see. So you walk into class for the first time. You need to connect this chap here to this chap here. We do that by plugging in our VGA or HDMI, depending on the separate set of them. So once you've connected all that up, well, that can happen before or after, it doesn't matter, but obviously you need to know how to do that. Those 10 steps. So the first thing we do is you plug in your receiver. Okay, so that's your receiver. You plug it into an available USB port. And when you plug it in, the first time it's obviously been plugged in before, it hasn't installed because the driver's already installed. And let it complete installing the driver. You know the first time you plug in a flash drive from somebody, it goes installed, it must complete that process. If it doesn't complete that, it may not work. Once you've done that, the second step is then to open up turning point. And I see it over there. So if you can navigate and open up turning point. 
and we might have an open, oh no wait there it is there, it's already open at the bottom so you just click on that. So here's our turning point. Step number three is check the receiver channel. So over here you'll see it says 41 underneath the receiver. So if I do the same on my screen and if I, well I'm not going to bring up the dashboard but I can click on this over here and I can see that my receiver is on channel 41. If you don't see that and you have plugged in the receiver, it means that they're not communicating to each other and it's not going to work. Okay, very unlikely you have that problem. I just want to at this point just talk about the receiver and the software. So we must just chat about if we're going to go to the new version of the software, which I do recommend. It's going to make sense instead of starting on the back foot. Um, it's just that if you plug in this receiver with the new software, you can no longer use it with the old software. It is frustrating that Turning Technologies did that. I do understand why they did it. They want everybody to get onto the same model and the same, and the same, uh, the same software. So what they did is that they, as soon as you plug this in and try to run it on turning point, uh, turning point 8, it upgrades the receiver. And it, for, that, for the first time in 10 years, it was not backward compatible. So just a word to the wise, don't download any new software unless you've communicated with the right person or communicated with us to make sure that you're dealing with the right software version. Okay. But anyway, so that receiver is now picking up. If I want to test that, which is not on these steps, if you just click on that 41 for me. So if you just actually click on it, what it does, it brings up a menu. So it shows you the receiver's plugged in and what channel it is. So this is where I would change that channel if we're running multiple classes next door to each other. And just to let you know, even in those environments, it's highly unlikely that you'll get interference because what are the chances that both lecturers ask a question at exactly the same time? Also, although the, these, are these walls concrete? From or was it prefab? It's called concrete. So concrete is quite strong to, or difficult to get through, although it can. So if you are super worried about it, change the channel, but then you need to change the channels on all the devices as well. Okay. You can also... How do you know that the other guy is not changing to same? Not changing to the same channel as you? Yeah, Ask him a question. Say, hey, bud, what channel are you on? <laughs> 41. Okay, so I'm going to do channel 80 today. Okay, so if you are teaching, speak to each other. <laughs> yeah, the rest of us is because we've got quite a, a number of classes that are simultaneous. Okay, so what, what we do in that environment sometimes, we just we put a little sticker in the classroom or right on the whiteboard. This class, click at channel 41. So when you walk in as a lecturer, I know I'm going to be 41. If I walk in next door, channel 62. Then I just change. So you just kind of set that up as a process. I can test this. So you'll see there's a button here to test. So if you want to drive so better than me upside down. So now what happens if I grab one of my clickers, I can test and it gets a response. It might fight with my one, but it gets a response. I can now walk to the furthest locations in my classroom if I'm worried that I'm not going to get a response. It's kind of a sanity check for myself. Okay? I almost never do it now because I've just never had a problem. So it's literally plug and play generally speaking. So if you hit a device and if you press a key there you'll see that you've got a second so if you just press, okay so press back and now I just press one, two or three so you'll see. Okay. But it's probably for your, particularly for the first time you teach with clickers, do this test because it's your own little safety net to say hey I've tested it, I know it's working. So when the student says, hey, ma'am, hey, sir, it's not working. No, I've tested it. I know it's actually working. Okay, so now we can go close. And we can also close this menu here. Okay, so just to re revisit. We've plugged in the receiver, opened up turning point. We've checked that it is working. We've seen the channel. The third step is to, let me close that, open up PowerPoint polling. Okay, well it says select a participant list. I'm going to come back to that. So open up PowerPoint polling for me. See now what's going to happen as you are teaching more classes of the clickers, you're going to have more and more presentations. My recommendation first of all, make sure you have more than one copy of your presentations. Locally on a machine, have it a backed up drive, have it on the local server, so in case your, your laptop gets stolen you don't lose your content and all your hard work. Okay? 
At this point now, we're either going to create a new presentation or we're going to open up a presentation that we previously created, okay? So for now, we don't have one, so I'm just going to click on blank. And I can do the same on mine. So if we had opened up, we would then go and navigate and open up a presentation that we've recently done. Um, so for instance, I could do this one over here. So now you'll see it's preloading because this is an example that has question content in it already. So we've got a whole bunch of different questions with different designs. I've already essentially concluded or used this lesson with somebody else. So the first step I would do is to go and reset it. So go turning point and I go reset my session. What that does it resets my questions and all my graphs go back down to zero. Because if I have a result and I try to answer the same question again, polling is going to be closed because it has data. <clears throat> so that's why you, if you're using the same presentation again and again with different classes, at the end of each class you would save it. This is class Web 101, Informatics 202, whatever it might be, at the end of that, and you save it with the name. Okay, going back to our steps. Isn't that scary? So you wouldn't have seen the question, just something random. So the question in this slide is whose two faces are those? And all they've done is they've combined Ben Affleck and <laughs> Brad Pitt. Okay, open up your presentation, reset the session. Then you simply go through your presentation like you would a normal PowerPoint. Clicking through, forward, either enter, spacebar, or arrow key and you would go through the sequence of your slides. At the end, save the session. And so the first most important thing I taught you today was how to create that initial question. The second most important thing I'm going to say to you is to save your session, okay? And to save your session, you click on the save icon on the turning point ribbon. So on the turning point ribbon, there's your save icon. Okay, any questions on those 10 steps? Does that make sense? I haven't lost anybody. Cool. So let's quickly go take a seat at your, at your laptops or at least your computers again. And let's do a demo. You guys get to run it quickly. I'll run you through that. Thank you. I'll leave that there. Actually, let's just unplug it there. Why I unplug it is because if you have two receivers plugged in on the same channel in the same class, it's going to struggle. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do on your turning point ribbon, on the presentation that you've just created, first of all, <clears throat> go and save it, so save the PowerPoint slideshow, give it a name, save it on the desktop if you'd like to. Okay, and once you've done that, go and reset the session by clicking that button there and reset the session. And then after you've done that, what you can do is go to your very first slide in your presentation. So let me go to the one that we did. So if I go here, I go reset my session. You also notice how quickly the software works on 20.8. It's lightning fast. 20.5 sometimes can be a little bit slower. Where it says live polling, I'd like you to select from that drop down and, and choose simulated polling. Because now what happens if I go through my presentation, I can go through my slides and the computer is going to generate responses for me. So essentially I can rehearse or practice my delivery of my presentation before class. And the computer then generates answers for me. And remember right now you don't have to really worry about um, saving your session data because this is all just test data. So you see this was this was the computer's answers. Okay so let's just go here. Might be because we clicked it a couple of times. Let's go save desktop presentation and save. Sorry, I'm just working on this computer quick. <laughs> okay. 
Let's reset, got a uh, Okay, so has everybody run their presentation there? So once you've reset it, start your slideshow by the <coughs> either pressing F5 if you're in the slide. It'll take you to the first slide. So click enter. Did you choose this? So hold on a sec, let's do this. So change from live file link to simulated. And then that's going to give you answers. Okay. Anyone with a question? Anybody not winning at the moment? Okay, you guys all winning. You've got data there. Perfect. Okay, so I'm busy running through mine on screen. It's giving me answers. And then when I've got to my end, so you see on that slide there where I had a correct answer. So the first time I click, it shows the graph. The second time I click, it then shows the response the correct answer indicator. Something that's very important to note, what happens, oh my goodness, I clicked too fast, I closed the poll before my students have answered. Okay, in that case, all as I do, on my show bar, that little green arrow with a circle, I click on that, it then re-polls that question. It'll reopen, it won't delete that result, it'll save it. When it comes to generating the report, you're going to have that answer twice. What you can do is just go edit it and remove the wrong one. Okay. And then you get to the end of your presentation. And what did I need to do at the end of my presentation? Save. Wonderful. So I know at least you've learned two things today. The one is how to create that initial question. The two is to save your question at the end. I click on save. Save my session. And that what, what you'll notice is that it automatically adds a date and time stamp. I personally like to leave that there because I may forget what I called the presentation, but I can always go back to my diary and see where I taught that class and then go look for the matching date and time. Okay. The next part we're going to do, are we all, is that okay? Everyone kind of nodding here. I'm just assuming that you understand it. I could ask a clicker question and say, do you get that, yes or no? Right. Oh, notice my battery is actually not charging it. Let me quickly go save. There we go, I'm charging again. Right, so, so once I have saved my presentation, I've come to the end. The next thing I go to generate a report. So if I go save, Save session. I just didn't can't remember if I completed that. Go to reports. I can do it straight in that menu. And now over here, I'm able to select what type of report I want. Whether it's by question or by participant. I'm going to get different types of information based on what I ask for. Okay? So obviously by participant is going to work when I've loaded a class and I've got a class list. And then I can have data per student. So let me sit if, for those of you who can't see that. Oops. My microphone's still working. Can you still get the audio? Okay, so here we go. So this would be a student over here. It'll have their ID right now. Obviously, the computer generated this, so it's got no answers. Here's the list of questions. There's the list of answers. And I can choose here to show correct answers or not show the answer choices so it becomes like a study guide. If I print this out, the student can go back and see what the potential answer options were, what they said, what the correct answer was. I can go and show how long it took them to respond to the question. So I basically, it's like a shopping list and I just choose what I want and then I generate my report. So then I go export and I export to Excel or CSV or whatever I want. Okay, does that make sense? The only thing you need to have for this to work is that you need to have Java installed. Which I'm assuming many of you will have Java installed on your laptops already because it just uses that to then convert the graphics into Excel. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? We're okay. Yeah, now the challenge is to be to get actually out there and start teaching with it. Okay? Um, the participant list I haven't shown you in detail yet.
But what I'd like you to do, there's a video on the CD. I don't want to confuse you right now with that because I don't think you're going to start with that off the bat. Create some content. The video will explain and then perhaps we can have another training session where you'll come with questions because you'll have some experience in the class. You can say, hey Dave, this worked well, this is not working, how do I do that? And then we can have a really interactive session. I do think we must just chat around which version. I mean, we can test these versions so you can, if it's working then by all means carry on for a bit. But ideally you'd probably want to get onto the latest version and we can work out how to do that. Um, would you like me to go through some best practices? How much time does everybody have? It's now 17 minutes past 12. I would say go. Should I go for it? You guys, I can ask a clicker question, then we get a democratic answer. Let me, uh, let me spend, a, it could be valuable, just to show you some of the, the theoretical stuff and practical stuff. And by the way, you'll see that I closed all of that although I did save the session. Turning Point does save everything of yours if you go to your documents. There's a Turning Point folder here. And what happens is actually backup sessions. And so even if you forget to save, it's going to backup your data for you, although those will automatically be deleted normally after seven days. Right, so let me see if I can find the presentation quickly. So just in terms of process, <coughs> you know, for me, any, any technology that's purchased, I mean, particularly in South Africa where we have, you know, very small budgets that need to accommodate a lot. With our, with our single budget, we're not only purchasing desks and tables and chalk and those sort of things, we're also trying to purchase technology and we're trying to put, you know, resources in other places in the university. So it's a, it's a massive challenge. And so for me, what's really important is that whenever technology is purchased at the university, there has to be a bigger plan. So what are the objectives that we're trying to achieve? What are the educational objectives that we're going to use this technology to achieve? Um, just some stats. So the, I mentioned earlier, so 40% increase in retention of information by using clickers. These are, according to learners, their response or students, this is what they found. So 87% increase in engagement. Motivation, 63%. Enhanced learning, 73%. Okay? 70% of learners agreed that they were more likely to participate because of the anonymity of the system. So the fact that I can no longer have to raise my hand, I can rather choose my clicker to respond, I'm now actually going to participate in class. Without that clicker, I'm not raising my hand. Okay? This particular test showed a 35% increase in test marks by using clickers in class. But now going into the, the process, so those are just some stats. <clears throat> this is what you should apply in terms of your approach to clickers. So first of all, establish your objectives. Why are we using this? Okay, so we have some of them already. You wanted to do the dipstick test was an example. You want to get understanding, okay? So once you understand those, we then create questions that are going to support those objectives. Determine the context, okay, so that's when we're going to use those questions, then we create them and we integrate them into our presentation. Here's a list of common objectives. If you have a phone, take a picture of that slide quickly. I can also email it afterwards. These are the most common 
objectives that we find our lecturers teaching the clickers, this is what they're looking to achieve in class. This is in no particular order, by the way. These are just a list of objectives that they are basically using clickers to achieve. Okay, determining context. So when are you going to ask your questions? Okay, I want to get a dipstick and understand whether they know the content. So last week I said to my students, go read chapter 10 of the textbook. Did you read it? So before I start my class, I've got three critical questions I'd like them to answer, which is going to help me to establish whether or not they actually read the content. Okay? Because that's going to affect how fast I can teach and how much content I'm going to get through. Okay? Mid-top assessment, let me quickly check. Did they understand the first half of what I've just taught? Or do I need to go and repeat some of the stuff I've taught? Or at the end, post-assessment, where you're doing revision questions, whatever it might be. So you determine the context and you determine when you ask those questions. Important, ask meaningful questions. Okay, the questions that we used today were not meaningful. What day of the week it is, you know, when was Trani merged? Find questions that are actually valuable to the student because you're also going to get a better response. The more engaging the questions, naturally the more engaged the audience or your class is going to be the more participation you will receive, okay? Peer instruction, this is where we mentioned Dr. Eric Mazur, and in fact there is a video clip Professor that we can play. Eric Mazur teaches physics at Harvard. Over the years, he discovered that students in his introductory physics course were passing exams without having understood the fundamental concepts he was trying to teach. In response to this problem, Professor Mazur developed a variety of interactive techniques linked to each other in ways that help the students learn basic concepts far better than before. Requiring students to read, think, and reflect before the lecture is the first step in Professor Mazur's interactive process. He also uses the course website to monitor their learning and communicate with his students. I don't go into the classroom lecturing on what I think they need. No, they tell me what it is that they want me to cover. It was helpful for Professor Mazur to answer those questions that we had. And sometimes like it didn't feel embarrassing at all if he addressed your specific question because the whole thing was anonymous. So the idea is to teach by questioning rather than telling. I will talk a few minutes and then put on the uh, overhead projector a question. See all those video clippers, overhead projector, not even a L C D projector. They think about it, and uh, after they thought about it, that's the first generation clicker. On their so turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. This process, this engagement, this teaching by questioning rather than by telling, forces students to develop these models in the classroom. I think the lectures were really good and it worked out really well the idea of everyone teaching each other. And we soon realized that yes, we were picking up the material faster than we had in the previous physics course that we'd all taken. You can forget facts, but you cannot forget understanding. And that's actually exactly what I would like to achieve here. I want them to understand the subject so that they know it for the rest of their life. Doesn't have, doesn't have a date. <clears throat> 2004. I'm going to test the theory. Oh, wait. <laughs> I'm running on. Actually, I'm happy that happened. So, what have I done here? Earlier, we were running in simulated mode. I didn't go back and change it. So, right now, the computer's answering the question on your behalf. So, I'm going to quickly change that. So just quickly for fun, do you want to test peer instruction and experience it personally? Yes or no? Grab your clickers. One or two. You get to play the role of a student. And I want to ask a question that you probably may have seen before. Okay, I only got six answers. 
So I'm going to base the vote on 6. 8. I'm happy with that. Okay, so most of you said yes. On that basis, answer this question. Does a magnet work in space? 1 yes, 2 no. Okay, key in your answer. Okay, got eight answers, nine answers. Come, there's more of you than that, yeah? Who hasn't answered yet? If you don't know, hazard a guess, it's just for fun. I'm not going to identify you, don't worry. Okay, so one or two. And make sure you see on your screen, you'll see that that number is shown on the screen. Okay, I'm happy with, okay, there's 11 of you. Now what I'd like you to do is turn to the person on your left or right, share your answer, and share why you responded. So explain to them why. Let's see if we now change the results. Okay, so now that you've, you've had that conversation, vote again. You may or may not change your answer. And let's see who's got, who's got the stronger will. Those who actually know the answer, or is it just the loud mouths that were able to convince you otherwise? Okay, so answer, answer again for me, one or two. I'd like to see that get past ten answers again. Oh, nine answers. Who hasn't answered yet? One or two. There's no, there's no reward for this. There's no marks. There's no naming. Yes. If I answer one, can I, can I answer the question again? It'll override. It'll override. So very, very good question. I'd like to share that. So the question is, if I voted and I want to answer again, will it override my previous answer? The default setting is yes. Okay. So right now I've only allowed one answer for this question. So the last key you press will be what the computer is going to store. Okay. So right, let's have a look and see. Okay, so first time round, most of us said <laughs> most of us said yes. And the second time round, most of you said no. But we didn't sway everybody because it went from 40, so it was 88.13 to 45.55. <laughs> so I hate to tell you, but the correct answer is yes, it does work in space. <laughs> So well done to those of you who were able to convince your mates to get the wrong answer on the next time they asked. <laughs> convince them, even though they were right, that, they were, they, that you were actually wrong, okay? <laughs> we just broke Dr. Mazur's formula. No, I'm <laughs> But the point being is that how it works. So the instructor poses a question, students answer independently, then you have one of three scenarios. Mostly correct, move on. Mostly incorrect, backtrack, go and reteach. Or equal split, discuss in pairs, and then re-vote. And then you can actually have. But it's a very good, because I guarantee you now that you will never forget that a magnet works in space. Why does it work in space? Well, let's understand. What properties that, does, does a magnet require air to work? Not necessarily. It's going to work in a vacuum. Therefore, it's going to work in space, yes. Okay, if, if gravity had an impact on a, on a magnet, so there's three things you've learned today. How to create a question, how to save it at the end, and number three is the fact that a magnet works in space. So today has not been wasted, and I drove all the way out here, and I'm satisfied that you've learned something. Okay, this is another chap I mentioned earlier, Agile Teaching and Engagement, Dr. Derek Bruff. He's a maths lecturer in the US at Van Bolt University. Great lecturer as well. He has published a book um, that you can just Google Derek Braff and you'll see he's actually he's published a lot of good content on clickers on his blog. He's got content, he's got information, he's got case studies. I would consider looking him up and his concept is basically almost just in time teaching. So as information comes in, he then responds to that information in the class and teaches accordingly. 
Okay. Um, this chap here, Dennis Jacobs, he's a chemistry lecturer in the University of Notre Dame. What he has done, he's got a matrix where he scores based on high confidence questions, low confidence questions, and medium confidence. Correct answer gets different points depending on the type of question. Okay? So what it does, it gives him a better picture when he generates a report on the class marks of what the true understanding of the content that he's teaching on. So we talk in South Africa about the bell curve and questions that are at the top and the lower part and you have to spread your questions along that. So same sort of concept here. So high order questions, high order thinking, low order thinking, middle level and you want to mix up your type of questions in your class and you score them accordingly to get the right response from your class. Student perspective questions, so this is a um, teachers and uh, humanitarians, a family studies, so I guess kind of like more the personal space, ethical studies, using questions um, to get information that's anonymous, it can be quite helpful. High level questions, so this, this is a very smart lady from the University of Texas in Austin, Elizabeth Cullingford, and she teaches English and she basically applies different principles. I'm not, because none of you English teachers, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, using scenarios, this is also really nice. We spoke about it briefly in terms of opinion-related questions. So here's a case study. This is what's going on. What are you going to do? A, B, C, D. Okay, get the response. So 30% of the audience has selected A. Who would like to, on behalf of all of you who selected A, tell me why you selected A? And then 50% of the people said B. So somebody you selected B, will you stand up and make a case for why you selected B? So you create a really interactive class dis discussion around that content. Um, I'm going to skip that one here. Just practical things now around making questions. Don't make them overly complex. You know, for me, teaching is about imparting knowledge. I have been in classes where lectures have been so preoccupied with making themselves feel like they're the most smart or the smartest person in the room, it's a destructive manner of teaching. Okay, so teaching at a level that the students are going to accept, questions should not be overly complex. You can leave those questions for tests or for conversations. But a clicker really is about the speed and efficiency in which you can get questions asked and get, a feed, get feedback from your class. Okay? In principle, simplify your sentences and questions. So, so take your question, do you need to rewrite it, read it out to yourself, read it to somebody else to see if you can make a difference. For me, slides should be uncluttered. Okay, we're busy writing a presentation course where we'll be actually, we've got content on teaching lectures how to teach. It's kind of in its almost middle to final stages of production. Uh, because I've been in a number of classes on the other side of our business, we do about 120 events a year around the country and into Africa, and we see PowerPoint presentations all the time. And I'd say one or two out of every 10 presentations I'll see are actually good. Okay? And unfortunately, I see a lot, and I absolutely understand the constraints that lecturers work with. It is a, a volatile environment, you don't have much time, the administration requirement is up here, the teaching time is down here, and so like, there's a lot of factors that go into being in front of a class, I understand that. But copying a Word document onto a PowerPoint presentation is not a presentation. That's a Word document disguised as a PowerPoint presentation. And so when we develop content, you need slides that are not cluttered, that have the basic points on. Um, Often a good idea to, when you ask a question, offer the opportunity for the students to say they don't know. Because if you don't put that opportunity in, most of them may guess, and it's going to skew your data. You're not going to get good, clean data. <clears throat> Whereas if you include an unsure or I don't know option, often the students know because they're not being identified. They will answer that, and you will know then accurately whether your class actually understands or doesn't understand the content. Use images, please. That's also a bit slanted towards me because I'm a visual learner. I like to see images, but I think a picture does speak a thousand words. And so where it is possible, use imagery because you'll speak to the visual. But I mean, the kinetic teaching, you've got to look at all the difference. So whether you're a visual learner, auditory learner, you know, all those different elements you've got to consider. 
survey opinions we've spoken about that at length between having you know a strongly agree to strongly dis disagree and the benefits of using that type of technique in your classrooms interspersed throughout so don't start your class and ask all 10 questions and then put the clickers down and then start teaching i guarantee you three slides in the, the class is no longer paying attention but if they are anticipating questions and they know that you well they don't know when you're going to ask they will pay attention throughout your class waiting for a clicker question warm-up questions always a good idea most of your students come to your class they might have come they've had they've been come from the coffee shop with a mate they're busy talking or they're playing on their phones they've been they're not orientated for your class yet so by asking one or two warm-up questions you're getting them situation situationally orientated so i'm now sitting in class i'm engaging my mind i'm starting to think i'm no longer thinking about the conversation i just had with my mates I'm now responding to this question. I'm getting physically and emotionally into the classroom. Make sense? Also, it's nice to have a structure to your questions. So again, aligning it with your objectives, what you want to achieve. Perhaps consider have questions leading up to a particular main point for the day. So have questions that are connected to each other, not just isolated questions that don't make sense to the content. Um, Having no clear answer, I also mentioned the advantages of doing that. So either having no correct answer or having question answer options that don't make much sense. Because what that does, it drives discussion. But ma'am, what is that? I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. Then all of a sudden, a class conversation can be started. Sometimes hide answer choices. So if you want to teach, often you might just put the question on the screen. So have a pre question slide with just the question text gives you an opportunity to explain it first otherwise sometimes you put the question on the screen and wow I'm already answering before I even know the context or what the question is about I've already chosen my answer to kind of defeats the object of asking the question so by having a question ahead of a question slide or hiding the answer options and revealing them afterwards is a just an option to you when you're teaching Discussion for the day, this is quite a popular uh, technique used around the world where you have each class has a particular topic for discussion or a particular point or highlight of that particular class and you always finish your class with that particular question and you leave that as the parting thought as they leave your class. Um, it can be used for attendance as well and also competition is really really powerful so this to bring out the competitive nature in the students have quizzes like you saw that quiz question you can you'll see in the scoring options on that side menu that you have the ability to allocate points you can allocate speed scoring so the longer the student takes to answer the less points they get it means you won't get a tie so a scenario you have a class you've got 50 students you've got 10 questions what are the chances of more than one student getting all 10 questions correct hopefully quite high okay and in that case now you've got a tie you want to eliminate the opportunity for a tie, use speed scoring because it is virtually impossible for two students to answer all the questions right in the exact same amount of time. What it means is that the student to answer the most questions correct in the fastest time will be your winner in class. And I want to skip that. I know I spoke really quickly through that, but I do want to kind of respect your time. I hope that was helpful. I do know it has been recorded. So hopefully, for those of you who want to play it back or share it with your colleagues, you can do that. Where to from here? Up to you. Hopefully, I'll, you get to use this in class now, and I've left you with enough knowledge to start the process. If you have hassles, please email us. Support at participate.co.za. Okay? You also have built-in help, what we may not have shown. On your turning point toolbar, on the far right hand corner, is a user guide that you can click. It's built into the system, okay? We do have a very basic FAQ on our website, although our website's busy being upgraded, so that's gonna change. It will, will be available, probably take us at least a month to get to it. Otherwise, email us at support and we can answer the questions you have. The only thing I would say is don't become dependent on us. You gotta learn for yourself, so first, jump into the guide it is search driven as well so you can type in gosh I remember in the training David said something about demographic type in demographic hit search it'll bring up all the topics in the help around demographics 
Any other questions? Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, how do you, because in as much as I see there are a lot of positives in this, but how do you try, because in my class, for instance, I try to get students talking, to participate. Yeah. But now with this anonymous response, you get even those that you try to encourage to talk, they become more resentful. It's a difficult question to answer, but what you, what you can do as a lecturer, you can only take the horse to water. You can't make him drink. Old, old scenario. But by using this technology, so the question for the, for the uh, cameras was, how do, you, how do you get that discussion going in class? Because you've created or you added a tool that may make some of them more reserved. In my experience, I haven't seen that. I've only seen it create a much better vibe in the classrooms. So you have this opportunity where previously I had to raise my hand. I can now respond using a clicker. So everybody's response is there. And then what happens to start the conversation, you may have the extrovert start the conversation, but the introvert will be a lot more naturally part of it because he would have voted often for similar reasons. It makes sense. So if you have like A and B, you have one person represent the discussion for A, another person for B, but you've got class agreement on those options in terms of percentage. So I'd like to get feedback from you. So once you started teaching, if you continue to experience that, and you see you're still not getting much response, let us know. And then I can also put out to our network and say, well, hey, ask the other lecturers, what have you done in these scenarios? The other thing is, is talk to each other. Share content, share lectures. Have a shared folder for Turning Point on your server where you can save your presentations for others to see. Class lists, once you've created class lists, <clears throat> and only has to be created once. So if you all take the responsibility to create one class list and then share it amongst everybody, it kind of halves the work, or a lot less than halves the work. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate it. And again, I do apologize that I first went off to the wrong campus this morning. I would have left half an hour earlier had I known that. <laughs> And it is my, I take responsibility for that. I should have actually checked that last night. I just checked Chinese, so I just assumed. And we know Assumption is the mother of all. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.